This is Brand USA Talks Travel, elevating the conversation about international travel to the United States. Here's your host, Mark Lapidus. I always enjoy hearing the behind the scenes stories from travel journalists. So when you're at a cocktail party, what's your go to story? You know, I actually stop and ask people about their travel adventures. I prompt them to kind of get through their stories. Then every once in a while, I might bring out one of my great travel adventures personally. That's what a great journalist always does, right? You answer a question with a question. Well, that's the trick of the trade. You know, get someone talking about themselves, learn something new along the way. And then after you've done that, maybe you can impress them about the time that you got transferred from one airplane to another by a really fancy car on the tarmac or a fun <laughs> story like that. I'm excited to have Scott Meyerowitz joining us on the show today. Scott was the executive editor of The Points Guy from 2019 to 2023. He's also worked at the Associated Press as Deputy Global Business Editor, and for over 23 years, Scott has covered travel and business for many major outlets, including ABC News. Scott has recently started his own consultancy with a very catchy name, Globe Trot Scott. Did you come up with that or someone else invented it? Yeah, Mark, that's a great story. Um, When Twitter started, I was ABC Scott. I was working at ABC News at the time, and as I was kind of thinking about what's next in my career, it was my personal Twitter account, but I wouldn't want to become AP Scott, TPG Scott, you know, it got a little confusing. And one of my co-workers, uh, Sky Brian, was like, Globetrot Scott, that's what we should call you. And it took off, and it's now sort of my default, I don't know what we're calling it, Twitter, X, whatever, handle there, it's my Instagram handle, so. So um, Globetrot Scott became sort of my unofficial brand in some ways. And people would stop me in airports and be like, Globetrot Scott, good to see you. And I'm like, only in airports am I like moderately famous, if I dare even say that. Uh, So when I started to go out on my own and start this travel consultancy, I was playing around with a lot of names, but Globetrot Scott strategies sort of seemed to fit and it's sort of my brand. So I stuck with it. Scott, before we dive into your new company, Globetrot Scott, I'd like to use the Wayback Machine and hear a bit about your past as the Points Guy executive editor. I gotta know, is there more than one Points Guy? Well, there's only one Points Guy, and that's Brian Kelly, who came up with this great idea 12, 13 years ago, where he said, hey, I can tell people all about points, miles, and credit cards, and actually make a business out of it. So there's one points guy, so to speak. But the editorial team there was at one point 45 people creating content, video, social media. Holy moly. And actually our male to female ratio had more females on staff than males. So there were plenty of points guys and gals. Or We always played around with what TPG actually stood for in a modern era. How in the world did you manage so many people, Scott? You know, I'm a good manager, I'd like to say. (laughs) People like me, I respect their needs, and I'm a problem solver. But um, I came in with sort of a mandate to grow up what was then a blog into its next phase. And a lot of that was thinking both up and down sort of the economic ladder, but also across the different verticals. There was never a cruise coverage. And as everyone here knows, cruise is one of the fastest growing parts of the travel industry. And there's not much in the points and miles game there. But if you're flying to a cruise, you can use those miles for a free flight. Smart people usually arrive in port at least a day early. Well, you can use your free hotel nights to do that. And people who go on cruises, that's just one part of their travel persona, so to speak. So we spent a lot of time kind of building out the right team to cover each of these areas and show that interconnectivity that, I'll be honest, no one else in the industry really had done. And then COVID hit. And we became the go-to source for how to get a refund. Then when travel was sort of back again, how to travel through testing and getting your paperwork done, where to even get a rapid test and what type to get. And then travels, boom. And, you know, it was definitely a wild ride. (laughs) Since pretty much everybody who listens to this podcast is a regular traveler, give us a few important travel hacks you learned when it comes to points. 
When it comes to points, there is no great redemption and no poor redemption. And I think I fell into this trap a decade ago where I would be like, oh, you can't redeem for that. It's not the best value out here. And start taking out my calculator and looking at how much you're spending on it compared to what else you could get. I've come to kind of be more mature about it. Meaning you just use the points that you have? Use the points that you have and you can't really be tied to, if I took four connections or fly on a Tuesday, it would be a better value. You have to do what's best for your life. And yeah, I still try to maximize. For instance, hotel points can be a lot more beneficial than airline points because Airlines still charge you taxes and fees, particularly internationally, on award redemptions. But if you're using points to stay at, let's just say, a hotel in New York City, you don't pay any of those hefty taxes that, you know, can be over 20% on your stay, and it's a better value. So I kind of look at the points and miles world now in two ways. One, I do try to do a little bit more in the hotel space if I can. And two, I have a lot of points with different airlines or transferable programs like Chase, Amex, Capital One, City, where I have the flexibility that if a trip goes haywire and I need to rebook something, I can get on any airline if I need to. How many credit cards do you have? About 30 right now. It was about 35 at one point, and I've kind of gone through and just figured out, like, where I'm traveling, what I need. I'll give you an example. There was a hotel chain that would give me up to 40 elite qualifying nights for having a small business and personal credit card with them. I've now hit lifetime elite status with that chain, so do I really need two credit cards with them? Probably not. So those got cut from my portfolio. I'm sure the credit card rewards landscape is constantly changing. You know, it's one of those things people are hesitant to do it, but the biggest determinant of your credit score is actually your debt to line of credit ratio. And I have some cards with some pretty big lines of credit on them. And I don't carry a giant balance. I pay off all my bills month to month. And, you know, if you have $1,000, $2,000 worth of bills and $200,000 worth of credit or something really high like that, your ratio is actually really good. And the banks like that. And it's good for you. The other thing is sort of the life of your credit, the length of your credit history. So, um, you know, if an airline happens to devalue their partnership with American Express, which may or may not have happened recently, you could downgrade that card from the $250 version to the no annual fee one that doesn't necessarily have the perks attached with it. You're going to put spend on a different card, but it keeps that line of credit open, especially if it's a card you've had for 20 years. You've been editing content for a long time. So what have you learned about content and engagement? In my two plus decades in this world, I started out with the print newspaper. I went to ABC News doing network TV, went to the Associated Press, you know, giant wire service, and then went into the digital space with the Point Sky. I did a podcast at one point at the Associated Press, so I've kind of seen each different bit of it. The internet and then social media have really opened up the landscape to a lot of new people. You know, that's how the Point Sky started. It was a blog and, you know, still online only, plus a newsletter and the social media side. But it has let so many other voices into our space. And you now have Instagram or TikTok influencers You know, no one's a reporter anymore. They're an influencer. And they have created their own niche. Having all those people have their own voice with none of the upfront costs that legacy media have has really put a lot of different people in the spotlight and not made it, you know, the rich white men of 50 years ago who in many ways dominated that landscape. So that's been amazing. On the flip side, anyone can be a reporter and there's no filter. And you see that a lot in the aviation world where planes 
divert or come back to airports every day. There are probably two, three dozen that that happens to. There's always some little minor maintenance issue. And the entire industry is built around redundancies and safeguards. And you'd rather take an hour delay and make sure that that indicator of light is broken rather than the engine actually being broken. <laughs> and I think you've gotten to a point where there's not a filter anymore. I still like to have a physical newspaper with a front page because it slows down time in many ways, and you have something that's curated and says, this is the most important stories that our editors thought of. Now, at the same point, there's a horrible bias in that, which is whoever your group of editors are curating what you're seeing. So I think a lot of people need to figure out what that balance is in content. How do you have something curated that highlights what's going on in this travel world? But at the same time, how do you get new voices out there? How do you get that user-generated content of someone being beaten up by police and dragged off an airplane because they oversold it by one seat. Those are the type of things that have changed our lives as we all have cameras and video cameras on our phones. And of course, how do we increase engagement both in social media and on our websites? It honestly starts with being authentic. And I hate to say that there's so many brands and destinations out there who are almost trying too hard. It's almost like that boy in elementary school who's just like asking out every girl to the prom instead of focusing on that one that really matters. And in my travels, I've noticed that every destination has something really cool to offer. And no offense to Applebee's or Chili's, it's probably not those guys in town, but there is, you know, a great hole-in-the-wall restaurant and a five-star restaurant. And yeah, maybe there's not an art gallery, but there's really cool graffiti along the wall somewhere. The more I travel, the more I try to slow down and get a sense of a place. And I think destinations need to do a little bit more of that to get people's attention. So yeah, you got to do the big splashy drone video showing off your wonderful beaches, the luxurious hotels, and the cool bars. Great. That's a beautiful 30 second type of social media post that you can put a little paid advertising behind and it'll get noticed. But at the same time, what about just focusing on one thing in your town, city, destination, and maybe make it a five-part series. You don't even have to call it a series. You just put them together and really slow things down and look at why one thing is kind of cool. And I know there's a lot of politics, who's on the board of your DMO, what needs to be focused on, but also like those compelling stories as long as they're really authentic, can bring people in and can even go viral. And it can be some of the, like, behind the scenes, like, this is the person raking the beach at 5.30 in the morning, so it looks pristine for you. We've already talked about how you've worked for so many big media companies, so what inspired you to go out on your own? One of the things that I noticed is there are a lot of hotel people. There are a lot of airline people. There are a lot of cruise people. There's the points, miles, loyalty, credit card world, and then the travel agents, the DMOs. There is not much crossover between any of them. And I've been fortunate enough to have this perspective as a financial reporter who's always focused on the consumer side of the business. I think that balance has always intrigued me of like, yeah, I'd love for everyone to fly first class in a lie flat bed with a hot meal, but I understand airline economics and that doesn't work. And I understand the housekeeping shortage that hotels currently have and the environmental damage of cleaning linens every day and towels. You know, Chris Nassetta at Hilton once at a conference, I remember 
this very clearly. He's like, you don't change the sheets at home every day. You don't you get fresh towels every day, you know, at home either. Do you need that in a hotel? There's some people who are like, well, yeah, that's why I'm paying for a hotel to have that experience. But for a work trip where I'm in and out of a hotel? No, I don't need that. For a luxury resort? Maybe. So covering each of these industries, I've seen how little they talk to each other. And I've also heard from people about this friction that we have. I've experienced myself, but many travelers have, where your flight is late, your hotel doesn't care about that, but they really should. And on the high end of things, I would hope that hotels are monitoring your flights, know everything about you, and are like, Mr. Mayerwitz, welcome. We know it's been a rough day of travel. We've got some water for you and a few snacks, and we'll get you right away checked in. But take a moment and relax. You're here. Those little thoughtful moments could help so much. And, you know, I could talk about storms and when things go really bad, how there just is not that interconnectivity along the way. So is part of the mission of your new company, Scott, to connect these different verticals in travel? Yeah. You know, I say on my website, globetrotscott.com, is it starts with the simple premise that there's too much friction in travel. And the industry can be smarter about the products it offers and how it serves different travelers. I really do believe that if you make the effort and somehow go just a little bit above and beyond, it will pay back financially. And not enough brands are willing to take that risk. But if you're willing to invest a little bit back in yourself, in your staff, in your training, in the mindset of what you're actually offering you can get more revenue out of it. You can charge 5% or 10% more than the competitor down the road. And what I've seen, you know, particularly like hotels are so focused on the chain level at how do we get more properties in our pipeline? We just need to sign that because that's what Wall Street wants. That's what the investors are looking for. But how can we maybe, boy, I keep talking about slowing down right now, but how can we slow down a little bit and just think about those basic things that we need to be providing? And again, your journey doesn't begin or end with one person. In the airline industry, we talk about the curb-to-curb experience. It's not the curb-to-curb experience. It's the bed-to-bed experience. I wake up in the morning. Was the wake-up call okay? Am I able to find ground transportation, whether it's public transit, cab, Uber, Lyft, whatever it is, to get me to the airport? Then that curbside experience starts for the airlines. Maybe your credit card makes it a little easier for you. And then again, the arrival experience. So I just think that not enough folks think about it. Not enough convention and visitors bureaus do think about like what's it like when you leave the airport or train station and then what's the next step in your journey pick on new york city my hometown for a second you know there's a train that connects the airport terminals with some public transit it's not perfect and you need a new york city metro card to pay the eight dollar 25 cent fare for it. But the New York City subway allows you to tap and go with a credit card or phone. But for whatever reason, the folks who run the airport have not put the tap and go technology in. And you have these horrible lines of 100 people who just get off the tram who need to now figure out how to buy a Metro card. And many of them are foreign tourists and they've traveled a long time. They might have waited at customs and border protection, and now they've got to figure out how to buy a little plastic card they're going to use once. It's just wasteful, and it's really bad customer experience. Well, I think we all need to work on frictionless travel. It's a whole industry thing. You got to be working with destinations with your new company. So I am part of a team that is actually working with one destination right now, and I've been talking to a few others. I've got my expertise, which really is around that customer experience. 
and I found it's good to partner with folks who might have urban planning or economic modeling background, and we've come together to kind of talk about how to help destinations out. But uh, I've been recently chatting with a few other destinations just about that customer experience and how to make that flow a little better, how to help people kind of get just a little bit more into a neighborhood, find a local restaurant, whatever it is to feel at ease there. The website, once again, is globetrotscott.com. Thanks so much for joining me, Scott. I really appreciate it. Mark, it's been great. Always happy to talk about travel. Have a good one. Me too. And that's Brand USA Talks Travel. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. Your feedback is welcome. Email us at podcast at thebrandusa.com or call 202-793-6256. Brand USA Talks Travel is produced by Asher Mirovich, who also composes music and sound. Engineering by Brian Watkins. With extra help from Bernie Lucas. Danze Karaoke. And Casey D'Ambra. Please share this podcast with your friends in the travel industry. You may also enjoy many of our archived episodes, which you can find on your favorite podcast platform. Safe travels.